is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering The Magicians. Season 5, Episode 5, Apocalypse Now? In this episode, the harmonic convergence happens way sooner than I expected. I did not think that this shit was going to be over and done with within the, the first half of the season. Now I don't know what the rest of the season is going to be about. I have no idea what's happening. Also, I hate capitalists. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Jesse for commissioning this episode. Jesse's in the chat. Hi, Jesse. Thank you. Matthew's in the chat. Um, guys, this one was one of those, like, this is one of those episodes that is a lot slower in terms of the progression of, of, there's not a ton of action happening this episode, but because it covers the course of several days and we have the harmonic convergence happen here so quickly, so much sooner than I expected. It feels like a ton happened. And also I want to say how odd it always is for me to hear my name on television. There's a girl named Natasha this episode and I do not know what to do with her. I don't know. <laughs> she, uh, she seems to be, uh, a bit of a red herring because I don't think that they wind up making a deal with her at all, uh, is the impression that I get. You know, we don't really find out for sure how shit went down, but it seems like we're made to think that she was going to be part of this and then she isn't. And all I can say is, I hope that I'm correct in that assumption because I do not want to see somebody without a shade again in this show. That is just so depressing. It bums me out, man. I don't want to do that again. So I'm kind of glad that whatever it was they decided to do, it sounds like they were like, all right, a shade is too high a fucking price. I'm sorry. We can't do it. Um, that said, I... Just finished covering season two of The Legend of Korra. And those of you who don't know, the harmonic convergence happens in season two of Korra as well. It's like a big deal that everything is building towards. And it's really interesting to see how differently they are treated, but they are, you know, sort of addressing the same phenomenon. And I found it very significant that there's like a big fucking party happening in this universe. That feels right to me. That feels much more appropriate to the way that people would probably, especially somebody like the, I feel like they're trying to do a bit of an Elon Musk thing with this guy. Uh, it feels like the kind of thing someone like that would do. Somebody who's so eccentric when really they're, they're not, they, they think that they are because it gives them some semblance of a personality, the curating whimsy. But in fact, they are the most basic because in the end, they care about money and they care about themselves and that's it. There's nothing cute there. There's nothing new or whimsical or exciting or anything that makes them any different than any of the millions of people before them who were exactly like that. And... I really enjoyed everything about the way the show felt like it was kind of giving types like that the finger. Um, so I am going to jump ahead a little bit. We have the, uh, the meeting at the beginning with Zelda and she's explaining to all of them about how the moon is pretty resistant to magic. And it turns out this is a result of magicians constantly trying to throw magic at it. And evidently this has created a buildup of like magical debris 
that has made the moon sort of impervious to it. And considering that we wind up finding out the moon does appear to be a sentient being based on the aura thing only. Um, That's all I have to go off of. But that seems to imply to me that the lunatics are right. The moon has moods and can listen and adjust and whatever. If that is true, what winds up happening at the end of this episode is so much more upsetting. The moon gets broken in half. And I genuinely don't know what that would look like if that were to happen to us now. I I know that the tides would be deeply affected. That's the only thing I'm aware of. And I don't know, again, what that even looks like. The tides being, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but the way that the tides work means that the shape of the water surrounding the earth is constantly in this vague elliptical shape because the moon pulls it. So wherever the moon is, the ellipses of water is pointing toward the moon because of its gravitational pull. I saw this demonstrated in some sort of like video and I hadn't realized that it was that simple. That it's just like, oh, the water's deeper here always. And it just follows the moon in that way. And so the Earth, while its actual like structure may be round, water pulls it out of perfect roundness because of that. So if the moon is gone and that doesn't happen, there isn't a change in depth because of its pull or If there's two pieces of the moon, each pulling in different directions, then what? They tried to avoid the harmonic convergence because of all of the potential catastrophe from magic backfiring and being too powerful. What about this now? Did they actually manage to sidestep catastrophe? Because this feels pretty catastrophic. And if the moon is so coded in... I mean, it was coated in debris that kept it from being affected by magic. But if it's been cut down the middle now and there's raw edge exposed that isn't covered in calcified magic, basically, does that mean those two halves are more susceptible now to magic than they were before? Can they fix this? Is this fixable? I genuinely don't know what to think. So I am... There's just so many questions here. And I, again, also want to say that what I'm asking about, like the real world implications of the moon breaking in half, I don't know at all whether or not this is something that the show would handle in a here's what would actually happen in the real world way, or if they are going to handle it in the simple way of what it would do to magic in this world. I just am not sure. Um, so there, there are a lot of questions here at the end of this episode. Um, and it turns out that the people that we are talking to, to find out exactly how to deal with the moon are called lunatics, which I think most of us know by now what the origins of that word. Um, and the woman who's explaining this to them, she says, there is a skeleton in the universe, but we are the bones. I am a humorous you, Patella. Um, I really want to know how she knows that. I want to know why she determined that Alice was a Patella. In any case, this woman has a tattoo on her eye called like that that signals that she is a lunatic and she calls the moon her lunacy before she shows the tattoo it's an a tattoo on her eyeball low enough down that you wouldn't really be able to see it unless she showed you or if she was looking in a really specific direction i haven't searched this 
But I want to know if y'all have the information to tell me what, whether or not this is real. Are there eyeball tattoos? Because it's the sort of thing that a big part of me wonders, why wouldn't that be a, a thing that you could do in theory? The the pain of it, I'm sure, would be pretty horrifying. Uh, I don't know how it would physically work. But there are so many things that I've, I've found out you can, like, you can get a tattoo on, like, the inside of your lip and your mouth. So maybe this is actually a thing. And it's just kind of, a, you know, most sane people wouldn't do it. But I do want to know. I'm just afraid to search it because I feel like the image that would come up, it would be very upsetting. And I don't like the image results on certain searches, as you well know. Um, oh, <laughs> sorry. Jesse's in the chat. Jesse says, sclera tattoos are indeed a real thing. But I've only seen pics of them when they go wrong. Yeah, I don't want that. Ah, that's so upsetting. She says, yeah, do not search. Well, thank you, though, Jesse, for giving me the information without subjecting me to the trauma. It's appreciated. <laughs> um, so, yeah, she says that the uh, her lunacy identifies as she, her. And... Julia asks, how do we move her? And she says, you don't move her in this sort of a combination of like, oh, honey, you idiot. And how dare you kind of tone. And Julia actually takes a really great tack here in saying a lot of people are going to die in a few days. And if the moon is able to be of help in keeping those people from dying. That means we've got a, a lot of people who begin to realize the, the value of the moon and perhaps want to worship, want to get to know her. People who realize that the moon deserves their love, their respect, their reverence. And I was like, oh, shit. Julia's being, she's a, she's a pretty good, like, politician here with this. You know, I was impressed. I liked it. So this actually does moon this woman. And she says she she won't let you speak to her unless you've got moon brain. And it, she says there needs to be three of you. A single magician cannot generate enough power to reach her. So... You have to not sleep for third. What is it? Three full days. Um, and then you do the Dianic ritual, and her aura changes color. Um, and if it's green, she's listening. If it's yellow, she's considering. If it's red, um, that's what that's what her aura is right now. And I think that just means that she's sort of at rest, but she doesn't really specifically say, it just kind of seems to be like, if she's red, you just don't get anything out of her. Only then may you ask her to move. Um, so I thought that this woman also, because they're visiting her in a psychiatric ward. And I thought this woman did a really good job of coming across as somebody who's not quite balanced without overplaying it, because I feel like people who are meant to be portraying somebody who's like, you know, kept in a ward permanently, which is the impression I get here. This isn't her in an outpatient or, you know, she this is where she lives. I, I feel that a lot of times people overdo it with the acting. And I thought that she did a nice job of just kind of overemphasizing certain like expressions like her eye contact not really being uh it's not it's not even simple enough to say that she avoids eye contact because she makes eye contact sometimes and then very suddenly looks away in a way that's like a little bit 
alarming or maybe she's alarmed. I just thought that this woman did a, a pretty good job of feeling like, ooh, honey, yeah, you definitely need to talk to somebody and you probably need medication without it feeling like they made her into a caricature. Because that's just, it's such a tricky thing. Mental health in this country is always already like so stigmatized. And media tends to not help with that. We really love our imagery of dangerous people who are who could potentially hurt you. And people who have mental health problems tend to be more on the receiving end of mistreatment than they are doling it out. Um, so I appreciated the fact that this was sort of a subtler performance. Um, and she says, as for the second part, there is a price. Um, and she says, you will need a piece of her, a sacrifice. And the piece will be destroyed. So be aware not to use your favorite one. And when she says that, she's got this like sound to her voice, like she didn't know that when she did it. And she still regrets the loss of the piece that really meant a lot to her. Um, so this is when Julia asks, what is Moonbrain and how do we get it? And somebody says in the background, come on. And she just stands up and says, putting time. And then lovely speaking to you. You too, kneecap. And honestly, I found that really funny. Now, here's the one thing that I got very bummed about. Uh, as this, this episode goes on, we begin to find out how much the situation with Dean Fogg is not what I had thought it was. I had really believed this was the like this was Dean Fogg getting to rest finally I thought that he was like being sort of given a break from his struggle with addiction and had been provided an escape and while Dean Fogg often sucked and maybe doesn't quote deserve the break or the rest the way that other people have. I have a hard time begrudging him that, you know, like he has just been, he really has been put through it in a way that I don't know that viewers can really properly appreciate because it so much of it happened off screen and so much of it happened before the show even began because of the other timelines that happened. But it seems that Dean Fogg's, like, being allowed to stay in the ethereal realm is a result of his own flaws and probably his self-loathing. And this conversation happens later with Zelda and Katie. But I just figured I would talk about it kind of out of the gate because Zelda and Katie's deal is... um uh, it's pretty, it's a, it's a side mission that doesn't really need a lot of attention. Suffice to say, they get spotted talking about the thing by one of Marina's uh, flunkies. I really do have to mention how much I love that Marina's still a wrench getting thrown into the works, even at this point. Like, it's just been so long. It's just... There's been a lot of time between when she was was presumed dead and now, and she still managed to pop up at the times that you least expect her. And I just love that about her. I love that she's just out here making trouble and doesn't need to draw so much attention to herself. She's like, oh, she, it's not that she doesn't love drama because she does. I'm not trying to give her kudos for that personally, exactly. More that she's very focused, so she doesn't involve the crew or get herself into their business if she doesn't really have to. And thus, she is just able to kind of skate right under the radar there and then pops up when there's shit popping off like this that's, like, incredibly important. So... 
just giving her her due real quick. But let's go to the conversation between Zelda and Katie, because I found this really interesting. Zelda spent three years in the etheric realm. And Katie is kind of stunned to hear that. I mean, Zelda seems like somebody who has seen some shit in a way. So I wasn't hugely shocked to hear that. But I appreciate the fact that Katie sort of assumes probably that a lot of people who wind up in the etheric realm are addicts like her. And she doesn't see Zelda as somebody who maybe could understand addiction. There are certain people that you meet that you just assume this person wouldn't get it. And a lot of times we're very wrong about those kinds of assumptions, but you know, and I was surprised that Katie brings up the whole thing with leaving the Dean in the etheric realm, because I didn't think that Katie was going to be so riddled with guilt over it. I really believed Katie was still going to be harboring some envy over the fact that he got to stay and she didn't. She wanted to stay. It seemed it. she still wanted to do the right thing, but she did feel like staying was desirable. And it's not until right before she's about to leave that she tells the Dean, I had no right to do this to you. You wouldn't even be here if it weren't for me. And at the time, I think I even said covering that episode that I was a little taken aback by her sudden change of heart right there. It, I didn't really understand what it was that caused her to, to turn like heel turn it from no, 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 I really want to stay to oh my god, I'm so sorry I did this to you. But whatever that heel turn was, it's stuck because she's still thinking about it and she still feels a lot of guilt about it. And I think at the time, I thought that her guilt when speaking to the Dean was her trying to like mitigate her own sense of loss that she wasn't going to be allowed to stay. I guess I didn't really think it was genuine. And so the fact that she is still feeling guilt over it surprised me because I expected that once she came back to the real world, she'd be feeling bitterness about the fact that she had to come back and instead, the guilt is still there. The feeling that she had no right is still there. So I guess I was just taken aback by the fact that she was being sincere, you know. But when she tells Zelda, Zelda explains that the king is somebody who enjoys people's self-loathing. And not even that specifically. It's not like, I like when people hate themselves. It's not that simple. Hating yourself sort of manifests in a desire to separate yourself from reality. And I think that is kind of the thing that he fed off of. People's desire to run away was something that he enjoyed and indulged. And once you began to come to terms with wh who you were and what you want and wanting to make amends, perhaps, or move forward, that began to be a reconnection with reality and a desire to, like, return. And that was something that he couldn't abide. So, essentially, this winds up being Zelda telling Katie, the fact that you still feel any guilt over the way things went down with the Dean and the fact that he is still there means that you are not you are not in the place that could be taken advantage of by the king and the dean made his choices he chose to come with you and if he was chosen to stay by the king that means that he has his own shit that he needs to work out and that is not something that you can take responsibility for. It is none of your business. And I understand the feeling that it sucks, but that feeling is a badge of honor for you. The fact that you feel responsible and wish that you could undo what you did is the exact reason that he didn't want you. That shows that you have grown beyond, like, because I think Katie keeps on wanting to 
break things into their simplest parts and be like, well, I really wanted to get high. I used this as an excuse to get high because it was like such a perfect opportunity. And I am still an addict who hasn't grown. And I let somebody get hurt and get in trouble because of my addiction. And Zelda's basically like, no, no. You may still struggle with addiction. And you may have wanted to get high and use this as a convenient excuse. That doesn't mean that, A, it wasn't the right thing to do. And B, you have grown. Just because you aren't suddenly free of this doesn't mean that you haven't moved forward at all. And that is something that I wish all of us could really internalize. We have such all or nothing ideas of progress. And there are certain things that it just can be sort of admittedly difficult to measure progress on. Addiction can be tough because it's like, especially if you're dealing with something that isn't food addiction, because food you need to live and that one's a tricky one. But if it's alcohol, if it's drugs, you're either not drinking, you're sober, or you're drinking. And it's very easy to be like, this is a binary. You're either doing well or you failed. Katie doesn't seem to really absorb how significant it is that she took this acid to go into this realm and came out and hasn't done a drug again. She did this thing, granted, kind of looking forward to the fact that she was going to get high off of it, but she didn't completely relapse back into using habitually. And she recognizes the fact that she used this as an excuse and did want to get high, which is also progress. There, you, When you are dealing with addiction, you become excellent at lying to yourself. You really fool yourself into thinking things aren't a big deal or a problem. So personally, I just really love the fact that she she is so self-aware of the things that she's doing and the way she's trying to sort of game what's happening. And she doesn't seem to realize that the very fact that she recognizes her testing the boundaries and sort of trying to find loopholes, she doesn't seem to see that as its own progress, and she should. And I'm glad that Zelda's there to at least be like, girl, you still care enough about right and wrong that this dude just didn't want you around. And if that's the case, you're doing okay. I just really liked it. So there's the thing with Penny. It turns out that he can't travel anymore. Like he could but he can't control it. He could travel, but he wouldn't be able to choose where he winds up, which is as good as suicide. Um, And that's pretty much the only information that we have on that. This episode, he attempts to tender his resignation. He is not allowed to do so. He says that like, I, I would like to, you know, put this forward. And she's like, "Mm, I'm not going to accept that. Um, Lipson. And, he tries to be like, no, 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 I'm not offering it. I'm telling you. And she basically is like, first of all, the Dean's gone. So I'm acting Dean now. Second of all, you're essentially disabled. And it would be a real bad look for us to let go of a disabled professor. Third of all, we are in need of a new, uh, coach for what is the name of the thing that they do? I can't remember the name of it, but it's that competition that we see in the first se- the first season. And honestly, I feel like that came up um, maybe within the last season or two. And I suddenly realized that I really want to see that competition again. I want to see that shit happen when there isn't some sort of like massive explosion of magic that sort of cuts it off quickly. And I don't know if the mention of it means that we're going to get to see it again, or if it's just a mention because we need something that's like familiar to the audience to keep him there. But I really would love for another viewing 
of that com- that house competition. Um, so okay, boop boop boop. I'm trying to find the spot so that she can. Uh, losing a professor is disabled on school grounds ain't happening. The optics would be sh- pure shit flakes. So your contract will be honored and enforced. Um, and oh, also. We need a new Welters coach. Welters, that's the one. Um, oh, Ashley just said it. Sorry, Ashley. I didn't even see you. I went back to the thing. Um, so we go to the castle in Fillory. And Margo is talking to Elliot about what's going on with these fairies. She basically calls it a genocide ethnic cleansing, which is probably pretty accurate. I didn't really think of it in those terms because I didn't feel like I got quite a great look at what was going on. But it does sound like what's what she saw. Um, and Elliot said, to be fair, the ethnic cleansing happened after the Dark King left. Now, I'm confused by this, guys. What does he mean about it happening after the Dark King left? Does he know the timeline of when this started? Because the Dark King is still here, right? I didn't really understand this conversation super well. She says, so what, he's innocent because he delegates? And and Elliot says, no, that's not what I'm saying. Someone in this castle could have ordered the hunting down of that fairy. It could have been the Dark King. But if it was someone else, killing Seb might just make things worse. So we have to find out who uh, before we coup. I don't understand what he means by the fact that the the fairy like this this cleansing ethnic cleansing as she's calling it i mean this is happening on his watch why shouldn't he be held responsible for it when is when he says it didn't happen until after the king left does he just mean it happened after the king left for the day or after the king like does he tell him i thought the way he said after the king left it sounded like he meant left the throne and i'm like that's i mean he's still here uh ashley says yeah after the king killed that creature right okay so elliot's defense is basically like he wasn't even around you don't know that he gave the order i guess That feels very weak to me. It also seems to feel very weak to Margot, but she's willing to respect Elliot's like, obviously Elliot is kind of into the king and he wants to find an excuse for this dude. And I'm just not entirely here for it. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. But the idea that a a search and and kill operation of this magnitude using all of these guards is going on and the king isn't aware of it and okaying it doesn't sound very that doesn't sound terribly believable to me um but i mean i guess it's always better to find out more information i suppose i just think that this is a result of elliot having some feels um so this is when Josh comes around the corner and he has a rabbit with urgent instructions because the apocalypse is happening uh, for them to go back to Earth and figure that shit out. Meanwhile, Fen is left in Fillory to do some reconnaissance work. And I love Elliot having to convince her that the maid on the outside is a real trope in like movies that she is sort of she he's trying to like make her feel like her part to play is a little bit cooler than it really is now just because there's no actual made on the outside trope that doesn't mean that this isn't still hugely helpful the fact that she's not dealing with the convergence this is still uh, like they're dealing with like a genocide situation here. Still very important. 
still crucial information that they need. So I just kind of wanted Fen to to take that more seriously, but I'm not sure how much he's told her because we just see him being like, talk to some fairies, get their side of things. And I don't know how much he's actually explained about what's going on. Um, But we see her come across a fairy a little bit later and the fairy knows her and is looking for her and expects Fen to be afraid of it. But Fen is just like, oh, good. Yes, I have been assigned to try and find some of you and, and figure out what's going on. So we don't see what the product of that. We don't see where Fen's taken. It's just kind of her story ends with her being uh, walked off with this fairy. But I'm super curious because the fairies, you know, we had seen them being hunted down because they gave people the ability to use magic when magic had been turned off, right? Um, I I think that's how that went in those previous seasons. Now magic's turned on. So does like fairy blood or body or whatever it was, does that just make magic more effective? Is there is there another sort of like production reason that people want them? Or is it a racism Thing, you know, is it something because they are what they are? I'm very curious to find out what the deal is with that. Um, all right, so five nights without sleep that's what it is. Five nights without sleep in order to get moon brain. All right, guys, have any of you tried to not sleep? more than like one night in a row. Have any of you ever done that? There was a, uh, I was part of this like commune is the best word I can think of. It was like um, a retreat in California. And there was a sort of ceremony that we would go through before we left that was meant to be like a rite of passage. And because this was like, you know, early college years um, and all of us were around 19, 20. I think I might have been 18. But part of the ritual that we did was staying awake for 24 hours or 30 hours, something like that. It basically meant that we couldn't sleep um, at all for one night. It was just the one. We had to stay awake until the afternoon of the next day. Um, And we were like at the rising of the sun. We went outside, did this whole like, you know, bathing in the river to cleanse ourselves, this whole like thing. And I was really sick. I didn't know how sick I was at the time. Later on, I came to find out that I had pneumonia I don't know if it was pneumonia then. I think it may have only been bronchitis. But y'all know how important rest is when you're sick. And I was in the midst of this thing and I didn't want to miss it because the whole like year had been sort of revving up to this big festival thing. And I just made myself participate despite being sick. And I will never forget how difficult it was to stay awake. And we were like, basically all locked in this room together. And we had access to like, drinks and a bathroom um, overnight. But other than that, it wasn't like we had phones or television or anything. And there was like musical instruments. So there people like began to do this drum circle in order to sort of keep us amped up so that it wasn't easy to accidentally fall asleep. And it was rough. It was really, really rough. And I credit staying awake all night with bronchitis and then being brought outside in I think it was probably February and dunking in a river for making me move from bronchitis onto pneumonia. I'm pretty sure that didn't help. That was some cold ass water. Um, 
And that was all I could think of with this, like watching them grow more and more exhausted and their brains just get fried. Be staying awake like that is damaging to your body. And the older you get, the harder it is to recover from that kind of damage. You guys know, right? Owen, my fiance, has really been running into this the past couple years. He had been able to work really late hours, come home and crash and wake up after like letting himself sleep 10 hours and be like, all right, I've, I've kind of caught up. I'm feeling better. He's turning 30 this year and he's suddenly finding that he can't bounce back like that. He can't just get one extra like, you know, four hours of sleep one night and that makes up for missing sleep two days in a row. It just doesn't work at this point in our lives. Our bodies are not as elastic and ready to rally as they were. And everybody's like depiction of being really tired here and the prospect of being tired and how like difficult it is. I really appreciated how they all portrayed that because different people show fatigue in different ways, you know, and not letting yourself fall asleep is Really, it's the kind of thing that if your whole self fights you, it's not you don't have the kind of control over it that you think you do when you start off. So everyone having to like jostle each other and play music really loud, spray each other in the face with water, all the things that they do this episode. Yeah, you wouldn't make it if there weren't other people around you also doing this. I just there's no way you would wind up succumbing. You'd fall asleep. You wouldn't know you had. I would definitely do the Josh. I would not have moon brain because I would have just fallen asleep. Um, so Josh is making coffee. He makes muffins eventually that have meth in them, but doesn't want to tell them that. Um, and I love when Margo's like, how about we get some cocaine. And yet when he mentions making these muffins with this thing in it that helped him study, she's like, mm, I don't know about that, but she does go with it. We also see the first moment of Elliot sort of like looking like he might fall asleep and stopping and looking around and seeming really, really alarmed. And at the time, I didn't know what to make of this because we don't hear from his point of view with this scene like we do later. But later on, he begins to hear, let me out. And eventually he sees the version of himself that was the beast or not the beast, the monster locked in his body. Like the when he looked a mess is the version of himself that he sees in the mirror. And guys, I had said when him and his sister got put, put in the mirror world and trapped there, that wasn't destroying them. That was just putting them somewhere. I was not entirely satisfied with that method of dealing with these baddies. It was better than nothing. But any time that a thing still exists somewhere, you're leaving a door open for it to return. And it felt like that was what was happening to me. Elliot continues hearing Let Me Out as his brain gets weirder and weirder. He doesn't want to admit to anybody that this is happening. And the only reason that Margot sort of figures out is because she overhears a conversation between him and Julia, where Julia, I had kind of forgotten that she is possessed by the sister. Julia is telling him, I remember what happened when she possessed me and I try not to think about it. I'm pretty good at blocking it out most of the time. But with this no sleep thing, I haven't been able to do it. And it's just been this like background montage in my head all the time. So 
I think I know what's going on with you. Now, she's not entirely correct. It doesn't sound like she's getting messages to let her out the way that he is with this guy. But I really, I assume that it's because he was occupied for so much longer than she was. That's like my assumption on why it's different for him than it is for her. And Margo overhears them talking and sort of confronts Elliot a little bit later and tells him like, man, if you aren't going to be able to handle this, you need to let us know because we're literally all depending on you. And if you can't do this, you can't pretend. And then suddenly like, dick out at the last second, as he puts it. And Elliot does that thing that he always does, which is assures everybody that he's fine. It's no big deal. Oh my God, stop worrying about it. It's not even like that, though, even though it's exactly like that, Elliot. And then sure enough, when push comes to shove, he is indeed not there because he has wandered off hearing this fucking voice And I just don't know what happens there because he sees this monster in the mirror. They get interrupted by a security guy who shows up and is just like, what are you doing here? I know you and your friends are here. Yada, yada, yada. We cut from there to uh i think let's see where does it cut to because when he's looking at it um he keeps on telling himself this isn't happening this is moon brain this isn't real but then these two security guys turn up we go back to the crew who is trying to like do the the uh deal on the moon rock And he just winds up coming in after Marina puts everybody to sleep. So I have no idea what happened between him returning to help his friends and being caught by the security guys. They are potentially the security dudes may have been infected with this this thing. I don't even know when when he asks let me out. I'm not even really sure what that looks like. Is that breaking the mirror? Is that all that it would take in order to you know like what how would you let it out? What does that even entail? Um so and Elliot showing up and doing something that's like intense enough to break the moon, it's got me wondering a little bit if this thing isn't back in him after all. It's really hard for me to say because he hasn't been doing super well. He's already exhausted, so he doesn't look great. This thing reappearing in him might not be something that's super obvious, and I just don't know what to think here. Um, yeah, I do not know. I'm concerned about it, though, guys. I don't like this monster coming back would be bad enough, but I just don't want Elliot to be put through that again. You know what I'm saying? I just don't want to see that. Um, so, okay, I'm going to back up a little bit because I kind of jumped over exactly what it is they need to do. They need to find the moon rock. There's an amazing scene where it turns out that Josh is dreaming because he fell asleep and Margot is telling him that she just wants to tell him about all of the emotional stuff that she's been keeping from him. And this is like the equivalent of dirty talk to him. And I just find it so funny. Um, But she tells him like, we found a moon rock. It's all set. We're fine. It turns out like they can't steal any from NASA because that's just impossible. NASA gifted some to people, but they all sort of disappeared. And then they find this one dude who has a moon rock and is also a lunatic and is also incredibly rich. And 
uh, his name is Oren Westbrook. Um, I love that there's a photo of him from the cover of Hip Bone magazine. I'm pretty sure that's the fake magazine that Margot's character, when she was like, had her identity redone, that she was like the editor in chief of Hip Bone magazine, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he invented the tech for pop up ads, and then he invented the tech to block pop up ads. I love how incredibly pretentious his feed is we just get a little bit of a, like a shot of it but it's just so obnoxious um Oren Westbrook's photo it's like a silhouette of himself and it's overlaid with like imagery from the moon and the <laughs> the caption on it is some random artist made this for me, and I love it. This belongs in a museum. Really bold choices made in this piece of art. The artist really owned the medium on this one. Forgot his name, but I'm sure having me post this is cool enough. Hashtag appreciate you, bro. Hashtag art. Hashtag love. You guys? I just love it so much. This is exactly what these kind of fucks do. They post it. They're like, oh, my God, I love it. And they do not give credit to people. They don't. They claim to love it, appreciate it, think it's really amazing. And then they don't even do the barest minimum of tagging the art. Like, it's just so good. And it's so easily missed. I love that this is something that you need to, like, be watching this and pause it in order to see the thing. Or else you might just not see it. Um then the cover of Hip Bone, the caption for this one. Who's that sexy beast on this month's issue of Hip Bone? Oh, that's right. It's me. Got nice and cleaned up for this one. Shoot for the stars, guys. You just might make it to the moon. Hashtag Silver Fox. Hashtag Best Issue. Hashtag Hip Bone. Hashtag Cleaned Up. Hashtag Shoot for the Moon. Oh, God. I hate him so much. Last one, I swear. It's a photo of inside his private jet. My office for the day. You may ask, Oren, where are you going today? My answer, anywhere I want. Impromptu trip to Tibet. Hats, hashtag jet set life. Hashtag luxury. Hashtag don't hate the player. <sighs> God, I hate him so much. He's just, he's not even real, but like he is real though, you know? Anyway, they go to him, Julia and Elliot, and she pretends to have one of these tattoos. It's illusion magic. Uh, and they get to see the moon rock and then she tells him how much they need it. And he basically is like, LOL, absolutely fucking not. She says, but we need to stop the harmonic convergence. And he says, but you know what that would do, right? And she says, yeah, it would stop a major like catastrophe. If we can hold the moon out of position long enough, we would be able to stop it. And he says, why? To which she says, it would cause worldwide destruction. And he sort of smirks and says, it's not like it's going to wipe out all life on Earth, just some. And she's like, oh, my God, you know how bad it's going to get, don't you? Are you planning to profit off this? And he says, I'm planning to use my resources to help the world recover. I'm an entrepreneurial spirit. I can't help but make money. <sighs> Yes, again, this is a real person. Well, some people might die, but like not all of them. You know, unless you're old or already sick, COVID isn't even that dangerous. I don't get what the big deal is. Everybody needs to stop making something out of nothing. I mean, 
If the olds or the disabled's are the only ones dying, why do we even really care, honestly? Because, I mean, whatever, right? Ah, uh, I should have known, but like, this was just, I loved how this whole thing was played. This just makes so much sense. And then be, pretending to be a philanthropist, I'm sure, is how he would frame the thing. When he turns around and tries to use his resources to help the world recover. I mean, there's a reason that we saw record profits for a lot of companies during COVID. And it is not because they give a fuck about human life. It sure isn't. Anyway. So he figures out that they are not real lunatics. They have to figure out another way to steal it. They find out that he was hooking up with this girl who it turns out is the daughter of uh, their fuck guys. I can't remember his name. You know, the Russian teacher. And he, <laughs> it, it, it turns out that she helped him put this like security system on the moon rock to keep somebody from being able to steal it right before they split up. Mayakovsky. Thank you, Ashley. So they ask her if she could help them steal it. And she says, I could, but I need something from you. A shade. Either of yours will do. Payment up front. And we cut right from there because Alice says, are you going to get it back? And she laughs and says, no, one shade payment in advance. And when we cut to her being involved in the heist, it looks like they have decided to pay her and we're just going to have to find out whose shade they picked later on. But what they decided to do, which I think is so smart, is they just do the ritual from the room the moon rock is in so that they don't have to move it. They don't have to steal it. It doesn't even need to happen. And they distract all of the security team by having Katie, who is wearing an amulet of some kind to make it look like she's his ex, drive away real hurriedly in a van in order to distract the whole situation and make us think as well that she is involved. But it turns out she ain't. Unless I am mistaken here. You guys all, you know, correct me if I'm wrong in my interpretation of how this all went. Um, somebody's asking a question. Tudor Jack, are you discussing on web talk? Tudor Jack, I don't know who you are, but I don't think you know where you are. Um, so, okay. They get separated at this point. We've got the one room that has, uh, Penny and Josh and Margo in it. I love Josh pretending to be a little snitch and them like having to play the role of like despising him. But Penny is so out of it because of the whole moon thing that he doesn't even like play his role adequately. And then we've got um, Julia and Alice and Elliot in the room with the rock about to start this other thing. All of a sudden, the security teams all collapse asleep. So does Josh, by the way, which I thought was pretty interesting. I guess Josh didn't eat the meth muffins because he had already fallen asleep and thus taken himself out of the running of having moon brain. So he didn't need to eat them. And it's just everybody else who has had them. So he's the one of the team that actually is susceptible to the magic that uh, that Marina is throwing around here. Also, I want to mention how much I love the whole team's like uh sparkly outfits that they're wearing for this party and especially Margot she's wearing something that looks akin to like a jumpsuit for like if uh, it's like a disco sort of look and it's great so marina interrupts and she says that she wants the harmonic convergence to continue to take place because she needs the magic for something really major she does not share what that is but she is extremely certain that whatever it is she's doing is absolutely worth the lives of all of these people. And we don't ever hear what that is. I am so curious to find out what it is that she was about to do. Um, but 
they get it. She gets interrupted by Elliot coming up from behind her. So it actually turns out to be kind of a good thing that Elliot went away because that is the only thing that sort of like saved them is having him be able to sneak in from behind. So she and him both fight to succeed with this ritual in moving the moon. He is straining to make it happen. She is straining to stop him. It looks like it's beginning to work. And the rock is disappearing as they do this. But the strain of her trying to hold the moon in place while he's doing the opposite is what leads to the moon breaking. Now, question is, does the moon breaking stop the harmonic convergence? It seems like it does. But what else does that wind up doing? And I love Julia looking up and being like, uh, guys, I think we broke the moon. And that is how the episode ends. And I just don't know what to think about any of this. <laughs> I think it's Elliot who just says, ah, shit. And that's how it ends. So, yeah. Yeah. I really can't wait to watch the next episode. This is really fun. I enjoy the misdirection. I always love a heist. Y'all know that. This show does heists pretty well, too. And uh, yeah, Marina's here. And what is she trying to do, guys? What is it that she's up to? So anyway, I have to go. Thank you so much again to Jesse for commissioning this episode. I really appreciate you. Um, and thank you to both Jesse and Ashley in the chat for giving me some information. And I will be seeing you again soon with the next episode. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.